Okay. Um, okay, take it away, Dr. Coleman. Great. Hi, Dr. Vincent. Welcome. Nice to see you on the internet. Um, so Dr. Sarah Vincent is a triple board certified child and adolescent adult and forensic psychiatrist, a proud alum of Florida A&M University for undergraduate she graduated from the University of Florida College of Medicine as an inductee in the Chapman Humanism Honor Society and with research honors. She then completed her general psychiatry training at Cambridge Health Alliance, such Harvard Medical School. This was followed by fellowships in both child and adolescent and forensic psychiatry at Emory School of Medicine. She currently serves as interim chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Be Behavioral Sciences at Morehouse School of Medicine, where she was the lead architect and is the program director for the Child Psychiatry Fellowship, the first at an HBCU medical school. In the course of leading that program, she spearheaded partnership with over a dozen community partners, recruited 20 adjunct faculty, and obtained $1.25 million in grant funding. Wow. Dr. Vincent first joined the faculty at Morehouse School of Medicine in 2013. Over the years, she was the co-course creator for the Forensic Psychiatry Elective, which she continues to direct. Dr. Vincent is the co-editor of two texts, Pediatric Mental Health for Primary Care Providers and Social Injustice and Mental Health. The latter text has been used for training curricula in psychiatry programs throughout the country and led to Dr. Vincent and her co-editor, Dr. Ruth Shim, being awarded the Creative Scholarship Award for the Society, um, from the Society for the Study of Psychiatry and Culture. She um, has been elected and appointed to national and statewide offices by her professional peers. And Dr. Vincent was appointed by the Georgia governor to both the Behavioral Health Reform and Innovative Commission and the Juvenile Justice State Advisory Group. Additionally, she is the current president of the Georgia Psychiatric Physician Association. Dr. Vincent is also a leader in the forensic mental health space. And I'll pause there. Um, the list can go on in terms of just the profound impact that Dr. Vincent has on the mental health field. And I feel honored and really fortunate to have been a part of her practice for a short time while living in Atlanta. So warm welcome to our Department of Psychiatry, Dr. Vincent, and we're eager to learn from you. Thank you. Good morning. I am happy to, to join you virtually. Um, and I... Um, recently stepped into the interim chair role at Morehouse School of Medicine. So that's been uh, quite a transition for me too. As of July 1st, I would have caught that I didn't have the Zoom link before then if I wasn't um, in, in that transition period. But I think for the most part, it's it's been a really, a really nice thing. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. And as I mentioned, I um, would like to um, make sure that the information is relevant to you. So um, if you have questions, um, you know, please feel free to ask them as we go along. And so what's ahead? Uh, we'll have an introduction, uh, talk a little bit about the mental health care system, about child trauma, uh, the carceral system or the criminal justice system, substance use disorders, advocacy, a call to action, and then have a discussion. And so one of the things that I think it's helpful to start with is uh, just considering uh, what we mean when we say mental health um, and what that actually looks like. Uh, because so many times when it comes to the mental health field or the medical field, um, even when we use the word mental health, we have more of a disease focus. We're thinking about symptoms, we're thinking about diagnoses, we're thinking about how people uh, move up or down on symptom rating scales. There's really not as much discussion about what health looks like. Well, the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. Um, so I welcome you to, to think about and sit with the fact that um, this doesn't say anything about symptoms or medication compliance or diagnoses, um, that this definition is really dependent on um, relationships and community and um, what the larger society looks like and what the person's um, interactions are with it. And so we know that when we're thinking about mental health, there are, are bedrocks, right, that um, are 
truly foundational to people being able to achieve uh, what we just talked about on that previous slide. So agency, uh, safety, and autonomy, um, we know are all important for all of the people we work with, uh, regardless of what their diagnosis may be. Um, so as we're going through this talk and uh, thinking about aspects of social injustice, I would ask you to hold these things and think about how injustice um, could impact them. Another thing I would ask you to hold is this idea of the American dream, right? We have, uh, for those of us who grew up in this country, we have heard um, that America is exceptional and in many ways it is. Um, and we've heard that it's a land of opportunity and in many ways it is, um, but that is not the universal experience of uh, working, living, playing, being educated um, in this country. And the people who have the privilege of earning advanced degrees, of becoming clinicians, of becoming uh, medical school faculty um, are people for whom often the dream worked, or maybe they didn't rely on it to the same degree. Um, and by that, I mean, when we look at who makes up our profession, it's largely people who came um, from middle or upper class backroom backgrounds to begin with, or people for whom the educational system worked and that even if they didn't start off middle or upper class, um, they had the intellectual ability, they had the educational resources, they had the family support and modeling to be able to use that system to, chain, to attain um, that professional status. Um, it's important to keep in mind that there is a difference between um, those we serve and our experiences collectively um, as it pertains to this idea. And especially if you're doing public sector work, um, that difference and that gap uh, may be quite significant. So if you've ever been to uh, the UK um, and you've ridden their, their subway system, uh, you know that over and over again on their overhead system, they say, mind the gap, mind the gap. And it's a whole thing. There's like t-shirts uh, with, the, with the phrase on it and, and the whole nine. Um, and it's super repetitive, right? But it's repetitive because the consequences of not doing so um, could be really significant. And this is the gap between the platform and the actual train. Right. Um, and so what I would ask you to do uh, throughout this talk and just as you go throughout your professional activities um, is minding that gap between what may be your lived experiences um, and those of the folks that you serve or those of the folks that you have worked with. And I do want to acknowledge um, that I am uh, not in a position to speak for the entire uh, house of medicine, uh, that there is division as it pertains to how much of uh, this we should be considering or incorporating into education or into things like grand rounds talks. Um, and there was an op-ed by Dr. Stanley Gofarb, take two aspirin and call me by my pronouns. And he at the time was uh, Dean at a really uh, prestigious uh, medical school. Um, and he said, why have medical schools become a target for inculcating social policy when the stated purpose of medical education since Hippocrates has been to develop individuals who know how to cure patients? Curricula will increasingly focus on climate change, social inequities, gun violence, bias, and other progressive causes only tangentially related to treating illness. And so will many of your doctors in coming years. Um, so he is, you know, clearly of the camp that, uh, you know, perhaps this is not our lane. Um, you can probably guess from the, the fact that we wrote the book and, and some other things about my background that I think about it differently. Um, and there were people who responded to this editorial, some of whom were from a uh, home institution. Uh, but one of those responses was that social and health policies have always determined who gets sick and who gets care and where and how. Understanding the social drivers of health and illness is not peripheral or tangential to health. It is the key to diagnosing and meeting a patient's fundamental needs. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you my view, but you know we often do disclosures for talks and um, I felt like I needed to disclose that as part of this one. So defining social justice. Um, 
you know, social justice is one of those terms that's been uh, politicized a bit. Uh, so sometimes when that's the case, it's useful to come back to the actual uh, definition or uh, a definition. Um, and this is one by John Rawls that is assuring the protection of equal access to liberties, rights, and opportunities, as well as taking care of the least advantaged members of society. Excuse me, one second. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I had it coughed all day, of course, until now. Um, but when you look at this definition, assuring the protection of equal access to liberties, rights, and opportunities, as well as taking care of the least advantaged members of society, um, for people who are in healthcare or who are in helping professions, uh, this doesn't seem like something that should be all that controversial. So some principles of social injustice. So one is essentialism. Um, and as we go through these, I welcome you to think about how you may have seen this show up um, in your training, how you may see it show up in your clinical settings or your academic settings, um, and how you think these things could impact um, symptoms that people present with or their treatment course. So essentialism, the belief that there are distinct, unchanging, and natural characteristics that define social groups and facilitate their categorization. Erasure of context, failure to consider socio-historical context when seeking to understand the etiology of inequities, and biological determinism, the false belief that racial groups are biologically and genetically different. And I'll give you uh, an example of erasure of context uh, that we hear often. Uh, so sometimes in uh, these uh, undoubtedly well-intentioned cultural competencies, you'll hear uh, people say things like, uh, you know, Black people have a cultural mistrust of the healthcare system, right? Um, and so the uh, characteristic is placed in a group of people um, rather than there being an appreciation for the fact um, that that mistrust is based on uh, real experiences um, that this group of people has had in a uh, racist healthcare system. And so it is a um, reasonable response to a systemic issue, um, but rather than that context being appreciated, um, the, pa the pathology or the difference um, is located in the affected group. Types of oppression, uh, so exploitation, the unequal exchange of one group's labor and energies for another group's advantage and advancement. Powerlessness, oppressed groups lack power and are blocked from routes to gaining power marginalization, expelling specific groups from meaningful participation in society, violence, threats and experiences of physical and structural violence. And when we're talking about structural violence, we're considering um, how sometimes systems can be sources of harm. So an example of that would be a child welfare system that has a child in 13 placements over a period of five or six years. Um, and then cultural imperialism. So establishing the ruling class culture as the norm and othering of groups that are not part of the dominant culture. Um, and we see this a lot um, in those, and I'm gonna pick on those cultural competency seminars again with this one. Uh, we very rarely, um, and I actually have yet to see a seminar that talks about white culture as part of the cultural competency seminar. Um, and that is based, at least in part, on this idea uh, that the white culture is the norm. Um, 
So health disparities. Uh, so these are differences in health status among distinct segments of the population, including differences that occur by gender, race, or ethnicity, education, or income, disability, or living in various geographic localities. And what I would include uh, as a catch-all too is, is a, a group that is somehow disempowered or marginalized because we can think of other groups uh, that may fit this um, as well, who we see different health outcomes in. And sometimes we use the word disparities when inequities may actually be um, more accurate. Um, with, and with inequities, you're acknowledging that there's a difference the same way you do with disparities, um, but you're pointing to, uh, you're identifying the, the root of it as being something that is systemic, avoidable, and unjust, uh, that is related to social and economic policies and practices. Um, so this isn't just a difference that is uh, interesting or notable, but it is one that is uh, a predictable outcome of the way that things have been uh, structured and funded or, or not. So when we think about the social determinants of mental health, and we've gotten better, I think, as a field in terms of considering these things, um, by the time someone screens positive for it in our clinic, or by the time we're having the discussion about them, they've already had the exposure, especially when we start talking about adverse childhood experiences and, and things like that. So the risk that they have um, of increased adverse mental health outcomes has already conveyed. Now, there are things that we can do to help mitigate that risk and that we certainly do want to do in order to do that. Um, but in an ideal situation, right, we wouldn't have large swaths of our society who are routinely exposed to things that we know are bad for their mental well-being. So how is it that in the United States, a country that has resources they could deploy in meaningful ways uh, to address these things, that so many people grow up with exposure to violence and neighborhood disorder and poor educational opportunities and food insecurity. And how is it that so many people are exposed to this over such a long period of time? Well, what sets that up, um, what is the determinant of the social determinant, so to speak, um, is our distribution of opportunity and resources, which is fundamentally a social justice issue. Um, and that distribution um, is, is shaped by our public policies and our social norms. And, there's a, and there are ways that we see our policies and our norms um, act in reinforcing ways. So next, we'll talk a little bit about the mental health care system. So uh, our, our, book at, our book authors for the mental health care system chapter uh, led uh, with a question about uh, if this was actually a accurate name uh, for, for what how our system operates. Um, so they pointed out that the name implies the provision of health but providers and policies focus on the provision of clinical services. That care suggests that services involve meeting the needs of patients, um, but what we see from a systems level is that services are often more centered on the needs of providers and the bottom lines of payers or shareholders. And system implies an organized, cohesive, connected structure and this is in contrast to the public-private patchwork of hospitals, clinics, private offices, and health system conglomerates that make up healthcare. So when we think about private health insurance, um, this we know is a mediator of access uh, to care, and it's concentrated among middle-class workers with skilled labor and white-collar occupations. Um, now, of course, there are uh, ways that you can be publicly insured, but we're all aware of um, inequities by healthcare payer um, as well. Um, structural processes, such as underinvestment in K through 12 education, job location mismatch, and hiring discrimination, all produce inequities in overall employment, so that employment in those middle-class jobs or those skilled labor positions, um, and types by gender, race, ethnicity, immigration status, and disability. 
And to give you one example of, of some marginalized groups, when we look at Black and Latinx people, uh, given these structural inequities uh, upstream, uh, we see that they don't have as much access to the kinds of jobs that private insurance comes with, um, and they're disproportionately represented in the uninsured and in those with public insurance. When we look at hospitals, um, what we see is that the most intense services, the most accessible services, the most bountiful services are not where the greatest needs are. They're not in the communities that are the most traumatized or that have uh, the sickest folks necessarily. Um, what we do see is that in, uh, in, in the model we have, uh, we see how hospitals um, can follow lines along residential segregation and can be placed in places where are going to generate the most revenue. Um, and of course, this is shaped by state policies as well. Um, and we recently in Atlanta um, had one of our two level one trauma centers in uh, Atlanta announce that it's going to close um, in two months, um, which <laughs> is, is going to send shockwaves through the entire city, if not the state. Um, but they have, you know, their hospitals in the northern suburbs, which are the wealthier part of, of the area. Um, and that's where that hospital system is going to uh, focus its, its resources. Um, but certainly uh, decisions at the state level around expanding Medicaid or even um, the relatively low Medicaid rate that we have here contributed to that hospital closure. But what that hospital closure means is that access for people in that area is about to go down. And when we look at physicians, um, and I'm picking on physicians here, I feel like I'm entitled to do that as, as one, um, and I'm aware that they only make up a piece of the mental health care workforce, um, but we'll just use them as an example for this, but I'm sure there are some parallels to this with other uh, mental health professionals as well. Um, and what we see when we're thinking back about that gap and people's experiences of, of American society, um, that there's a mismatch of providers versus the population. Um, with the medical profession reflecting the consequences of economic and social inequality of the U.S. society at large. In 2019, only 5% of medical students reported parental incomes in the bottom quintile of the U.S. household versus 51% in the top. From 2010 to 2016, even though the mean debt of people who graduated from medical school rose, the percent zero debt also rose from 16 to 27%. So this means that more than one out of one out of four people who graduated medical school came from families where uh, people could just write a check uh, for undergraduate and for medical school. And when we look at people's uh, willingness to practice in uh, marginalized communities, in their commitment to providing care uh, for those populations, the most consistent predictor is that they have ties uh, to those communities or to those uh, populations. Um, and so we have a system um, that makes it difficult for people from those marginalized communities to attain these different uh, levels of education and go through these different steps. And so at the end of it, you have a professional uh, field uh, that may not be as invested in uh, correcting some of these inequities that we see. And so with that backdrop, it could help you look at racial inequities as it pertains to treatment a bit differently and maybe a bit differently than ways it's been presented before. So in 2018, 69% uh, of Black adults with any mental illness received no treatment, whereas 42% of Black adults with serious mental illness received no treatment. And for Latinx adults, uh, those numbers were 67% and 44% respectively. So when we're thinking about health insurance, when we're thinking about Medicaid, when we're thinking about whether people have access, um, there are ways that we know sometimes coverage doesn't always equate to access because of things like benefit limits or cost sharing or lower reimbursement rates that make it harder for hospital systems to um, dedicate a lot of their real estate, so to speak, to providing mental health care. And in some instances, there may be no coverage at all. Um, and what we see is that a lot of um, 
mental health providers relative to other uh, medical fields uh, may opt out of insurance at all. So even people who are privately insured may have to pay out of pocket. Um, and as a result, 3.6 to 5.8 times um, higher than other specialties is our proportion of mental health services um, provided. Dr. Vincent, I see a hand up. Do you want to, is it okay to take a question? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, Alyssa? Yes. Um, I was just curious, you're, you're talking about the numbers of, of um, Black and Latinx adults who don't receive care. I'm just wondering how that compares to white people. Um, I, I think I can guess which direction it goes, but I'm just wondering if there's data to back that up. Yeah, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but definitely those numbers um, in terms of access um, are better um, for white people. Um, and what you see is that, um, as, as, as I mentioned, coverage still doesn't always equal access. Um, and one of the things that comes up a lot um, when you're talking about Black and Latinx folks, and, and, it's a, and it's a valid thing to come up, but I think that sometimes uh, it's given a bit too much uh, airtime, is this issue or this question of stigma, right? And it's and it's not that I don't think that stigma applies to, to white people too, but you have to worry about double stigma and um, the fear of being marginalized further when you're already part of a marginalized group when you're talking about people who are racial minorities or who are minoritized in some other way. Um, but you're right in that you do see better access numbers for white people. Um, that said, as a whole, we know in our country, um, our mental health system um, is not um, the best at serving people um, on a population level overall. Um, and so in, in, in getting back to this, this stigma you know, issue, um, there's a study by Elaine that was published in Health Services Research in 2019. Um, and he asked Black people why they did not get mental health services. And what they said when they were asked is that cost is the most commonly cited reason for not seeking care. This was twice as often as minimization of symptoms and nearly five times as often as stigma. So if we're having real conversations about inequities, we can't just say black people have stigma and wanna pray about it, which is what I often hear. Um, we have to look at these other contributors and the ways that access to care is mediated by societal structures that have this racial stratification um, that's an element of them that are going to present structural barriers to care. And that's a really important distinction. It's not just an academic one, because if the focus is on uh, stigma, then an ad campaign is the solution. If the focus is on these uh, systemic issues, then we understand that it requires a different kind of solution or approach. And um, I don't wanna be too cynical, but I think that some of the focus on stigma at the expense of uh, these structural issues is so that people um, can, can get away with not looking as hard at, at how the systems are perpetuating them. So next we go into substance use disorders. And this is a really um, nice illustration of the narrative part. So if, we, if you think back to that diagram a few slides ago about public policies and social norms, how narratives and how things are framed um, really impact mental health care um, or, or lack thereof. So with substance use disorders, uh, you have in where someone or something is perceived and defined as a threat to social norms, where news media and communities depict the threat in symbolic ways. There's widespread public concern that's aroused by these portrayals. Authorities and policymakers respond to the threat with new laws or policies, and these actions lead to social change in the community. And that moral panic, of course, uh, describes uh, our country's response to the cocaine epidemic, um, which, by the way, um, has not been fixed or cured, um, even though you wouldn't know it by looking at the APA website or, or things like that. Um, but what you saw is stigmatizing language like crack kids. Um, and this language, again, it's, it's not just academic, it's not just a, a headline, but it frames this group of people in a way that sets up a response that is not therapeutic, uh, but that is punitive. 
and that is abdicated to uh, the justice system. So Ernest Strucker in A Plague of Prisons says the fundamental clinical accountability of drug treatment professionals to individual patients has been subordinated to the goals of the criminal justice system. So what you saw was an 18 to one uh, disparity uh, between crack and cocaine not because of something chemical, but because of the narrative that accompanied uh, the substance based on uh, the view of the person and the status of the person that was associated with it um, in, in, in discussions. And while there have been things that have been done since then to try to close this gap some, it doesn't make up for the fact that an entire generation um, was subjected to these harsher um, sentences. And I welcome you to contrast that uh, with how our nation has responded to the opioid epidemic. Um, so we don't call them crack babies, we call them children. And we show loving pictures of mothers who are trying to do the best that they can. Um, and this has led to right, a different kind of discussion and not to say that criminal justice doesn't still enter into um, into opioids as well, but we've seen where uh, there's been a response from the medical community, from the scientific community, um, whether it's federal research dollars or things that are happening at clinic levels, that is very, very different um, than what we see from cocaine, even though Black men are still dying from cocaine overdoses at about the same rate that white men are dying from opioid overdoses. Um, but what this means, right, what this, um, differential valuation of the people associated with the drug translates to um, are differences in access because of emphasis that's being placed on training, education, service provision, and research um, for this particular substance use disorder. And so those inequities I uh, gave you earlier, or, or those numbers I gave you earlier that were um, already pretty bad about people being able to receive treatment are even worse uh, with substance use disorders, with 89% of Latinx adults with substance use disorders uh, reporting receiving no treatment and 88% of Black adults reporting receiving no treatment. And next we will go into child trauma. So as uh, Dr. Coleman mentioned, I trained at Cambridge for my general psychiatry residency. And I had the opportunity uh, to work under uh, Dr. Judith Herman. And, you know, it's one of those things that was really early in my career and I had no idea how foundational um, that would be for me in, in literally every aspect of, of what I do. Um, and in trauma and recovery, she says the developing child's positive sense of self depends on the caregiver's benign use of power. Um, and I'm sure that, that many of you have, have read that book and you know that uh, it's focused more so on um, domestic violence and child sexual trauma and incest and things that happen within the family unit. Uh, but I would posit that uh, when we're thinking about um, social determinants of mental health, uh, that the caregiver could be extrapolated to include all of the systems that are entrusted with shepherding a child from infancy and toddlerhood into um, that, that idea of, of a mentally healthy adulthood um, that we talked about earlier. So thinking about things like the educational system, the juvenile justice system, child welfare, that all of these are um, potential caregivers. And they all have a tremendous amount of power over people's uh, lived experiences during really critical developmental uh, windows. And they have power that is inescapable and that is present over a long period of time. Um, and when that power is not used in a way that is helpful uh, to these people, there is a traumatic element to it. And so some of the things that she described um, as really differentiating complex trauma the fact that it was inescapable, that it happened in the context of a relationship, that it uh, wasn't just this isolated event, I think can be applied in, in a lot of ways to structural traumas as well. So I've worked in public sector psych, private psych, and done forensic consults throughout my career. Um, and these are three people I met in those different capacities. Uh, so one was an adult defendant in a capital murder case, uh, meaning a death penalty case. 
said I was proud to make it to 21, even though I was in prison. Uh, the second was a software programmer in my private practice who said school was all I ever really had to worry about when I asked him about his childhood. And the third was a teenager in a regional youth detention center, in other words, jail for kids, um, who said they say I'm supposed to care about people when ain't nobody cared for me when I asked him about his. And so we know that there are things that set people up, right, to achieve uh, that, that ideal of, of mental health. Um, and they include a true home, a reliable caregiver, educational opportunity, and health care, uh, both in terms of adequacy and access. Child poverty um, is something uh, that we know can undermine uh, each of those things. Um, in the United States, one out of six U.S. children live in poverty. This is under $26,500 a year for a family of four. Um, and as many of you know, um, I'm sure all of you know, uh, there are lots of folks in this country who can't reliably and consistently make ends meet for four people, um, even if they have $30,000 a year or $40,000 a year. Um, so in, it, there are certainly ways that this number is artificially deflated. When we look at those impacted by child poverty, 73% are children of color. Um, and we see that the child poverty rate is nearly one and a half times higher than that for adults ages 18 to 64. You know, it's interesting, a lot of times when we talk about marginalized populations, we don't include children on the list, uh, but by almost every measure you can think of, um, they absolutely should be. And this happens, um, this is allowed to happen in a country that spends over $700 billion on defense, which is more than the next 10 countries combined, and where a majority of US lawmakers are millionaires. So it's not a matter of, do we have the resources? It's a matter of how we've chosen to allocate those resources and how the people we elect to go to office choose to allocate those resources. Um, Brian Stevenson, who uh, is a, an attorney, um, he has argued before the Supreme Court, and you may know uh, his book, uh, Just Mercy, and I think they made a movie about it too. But one of the things that he says is that when it comes to fixing um, some of the things that are problems in our society, one of our challenges is that uh, the decision makers don't have proximity to the pain. Um, and I think that this is quite uh, an illustration uh, of that issue. And so with poverty, right, uh, you experience things like housing instability, food insecurity, depending on where you are, that may also come with a heavy police presence in the neighborhood as well. Strained caregivers um, who, if they are poorly supported, if they can't get the care they need, if they don't feel stable, certainly can't provide that for their child. Um, parents who are trying to make ends meet without a living wage, unmet educational needs, again, that aren't necessarily based in the child or in the family unit, but are related to chronically, systematically under-resourced school districts, which we all know are the case, right? Otherwise, people wouldn't pay $60,000 more in property taxes to live two miles away. Um, and what you see with that system, right, is that you have the replication of extant social hierarchies rather than it being this place for people to um, improve their station or change their station in life as a whole. And then limited access, right, in, in mental health with gaps in coverage and capacity and untreated illness impacting attendance and behavior if we're talking about school. So coming back to Miguel, and I've changed his name for the purposes um, of, of the talk, um, he was incarcerated from the age of 17 to 21. Um, he was found to be in violation of plan after being found in possession of a small amount of marijuana. Um, so he was hardly some huge risk to society. Um, but this was used to lock him up in an adult facility during this really critical um, period for him as he was uh, emerging into, into adulthood. And even his original charge had been one that was nonviolent. And when we look at um, the unmet needs that he experienced, 
um, it was a list of all the things that we know statistically increase people's risk for involvement in the juvenile justice system. Um, so he was exposed to things like poverty, community instability, um, crime, uh, the availability of firearms. His sense of safety was chronically um, threatened by victimization, maltreatment, family conflict, and the things that were going on in his community as well. Um, there were problems behavior in his family, um, but this translated uh, to him not only not uh, belonging there, uh, but not belonging in the school system. And then there was a structural component superimposed uh, by his many changes once he entered uh, the foster care system. And so we think about this from a systemic standpoint, often we'll think about family dysfunction, right? And that was certainly the case with him. Um, his mother had abandoned him and she had untreated sexual trauma and substance use disorder herself. Her father wasn't his father was incarcerated on a nonviolent drug offense, and he'd been abused by his grandmother and brother and seen his mother abused. Um, he came from a, a neighborhood that was notoriously violent um, in South Florida, um, experienced housing and food instability. Um, but when we think about the systems, right? So once we say this is a child who needs help, who this family can't adequately support, the system stepped in. And, in his case, that was around the age of eight or nine years old. Um, but even when that happened, when the child protective system uh, was entrusted with his care, he ended up having 12 different foster care placements. Um, and with that many moves, unmet educational needs um, and unmet mental health needs uh, took place. And so even though he first attempted suicide at nine years old, um, he didn't have significant mental health services in place um, at any point while he was with the system. Sometimes he would start, uh, but then there would be some reason he had to move and there was a lack of continuity there. So it's one thing for the family not to provide what he needs, right? It's another thing for the system that's supposed to be there to take care of him, if his family can't, to also not take care of his needs, right? And how was that allowed to happen? Well, if we take another step back, um, what we see is that he was in a state that has very low per capita mental health spending um, that is always toward the, the very bottom. Uh, there was uh, significant child protective services under staffing. And it was a time in, when we're thinking about the norms and the narratives where there was a very punitive stance toward adolescents where people were saying things like, you do adult crime, you get adult time. And in some ways we may be seeing that pendulum swing back toward, uh, toward that. So Miguel's story is one, um, but I can tell you there are threads to his story that I see in almost all of the forensic mental health consults I do on the criminal side. Um, and with that being the formative environment for the populations that are overrepresented in the system, it's then not at all surprising that you also have an overrepresentation of mental illness. Uh, with 70% of these youth having mental illness and 30% having serious, which is defined for the purposes of that study uh, with having bipolar or schizophrenia or major depressive disorder. And I would say that those numbers are likely um, an underestimate um, in no small part because the traumas that they have experienced that this uh, overrepresented population when we're talking about the juvenile justice system um, are often not counted. Um, and so there's the question of whose trauma counts in our diagnostic criteria, in our widely used instruments. And there are ways that sometimes in the mental health profession that we can be bystanders. Um, so what do I what do I mean by this? Um, we know that racism, we know that uh, neighborhood violence. Um, there are things that uh, the literature has made very clear have psychological harm to people um, that don't show up 
in the DSM in any significant way that may not show up on our trauma screens, um, like the original 10 question um, ACE questionnaire. Um, and the question is, if we know these things are harmful, why aren't they included um, in these things that we use to guide how we diagnose people and to guide how we pick up on whether or not people have had uh, traumatic exposures? And I would posit that that omission is one that is driven by injustice and inequity. And in um, our valuation as a field, which reflects the valuation of our society um, of certain groups uh, experiences over others. So by way of example, um, the original 10 question ACE questionnaire was developed on a largely college educated, largely middle class, largely white um, population in Northern California. Depending on where you practice, that may or may not be representative of who you're trying to take care of at all. Um, so things like um, neighborhood violence or racial traumas were not relevant, so they're not included in that questionnaire. Uh, but there are ways in mental health that we often don't ask, how does this apply to who I take care of, um, whose experiences were left out, um, and what should I do, or, or how should I correct for that? And when we don't ask those questions, there are ways that we in the mental health field can be not only bystanders, but also perpetrators of inequity. Um, and an example that I see again and again and again are how the traumas of marginalized populations are not captured in their mental health records, despite indicators that the mental health evaluator was aware of them. They're not reflected in their diagnosis and they're not incorporated or articulated in their formulations. I have seen again and again where um, black and brown boys uh, who grow up to be the men whose cases I'm working on uh, were diagnosed with things like conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder, where there was no mention of the fact that they were in the home while their mother overdosed and they found their body. There's no mention of the fact that they were beat with a pistol and left in a trunk. There's no mention of the fact that five of their friends have been murdered by the time that they were 17. So these traumas that they experience um, are pushed aside, are minimized, aren't given the full weight of consideration. And rather than them having a diagnosis, rather than them having a write-up that takes those things into account and fully considers them, their external behaviors are what is, is focused on and when that person, if that person ends up entering into the juvenile justice or the criminal justice system, those diagnoses of ODD and conduct disorder may be weaponized against them. And the lack of recognition of these other diagnoses that could potentially be mitigating for them, like major depressive disorder or PTSD, or even if they don't meet um, full criteria for PTSD, naming that there is some sort of trauma-related uh, disorder um, are not in the chart. And what I see over and over again is that these evaluators um, are naming symptoms of trauma, but not calling it that. Um, and it has implications in our system, right? Because it means that these kids don't get the care that they need, um, but it can have tremendous ones um, if they end up in the criminal justice system as well. When I was working at juvenile justice, um, I cannot tell you how many times uh, they came in with diagnoses of ODD, conduct disorder, uh, maybe even bipolar uh, disorder, when it all went back to trauma. But the way that we ask questions, uh, the questions are forms prompt us to inquire about missed it. And they missed it in a way that had really significant um, bearing on these children's diagnoses and, and treatment and care. So this is a screenshot of um, a young Black boy who was playing basketball in his own front yard. He wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, when the police car drove by, he stopped playing and hid behind the car waited until the police car uh, 
went down the street and then started playing again. And this was captured by the home uh, security footage. And his dad saw what happened and asked him why he did that. And the young boy's response was, because they killed George Floyd. So this wasn't a, a young man who knew George Floyd, but he knew I have the same skin that he has and police officers hurt people who look like me. We see, even though this is a benign example, how it shaped his behavior. And we know that identifying uh, with someone who has been harmed, especially by someone with the power of the state behind him, uh, can influence people's sense of safety in society. Um, and yet there's no place. There's no way for us to document this uh, using uh, DSM criteria as it's currently uh, written, um, even though this is a very relevant part of people's lived experience and could impact how uh, they present to you in, in a clinic. Um, I'm not sure if any of you will be at the Mental Health Services Conference next month, but I'm actually presenting with two, um, two men, one a Black male resident, one a biracial um, man who's been in the justice system about uh, this this differentiation between paranoia and fear, right? And, and putting people's experiences in societal context and what that looks like um, for us when people are justice involved or, or have been. But, you know, things like deaths in police custody are the aspects of the system where the inequity goes viral and enters the popular consciousness. Um, but that's not to say that they are the only manifestations of it. Um, most judges acknowledge that the system is racist. 80% um, of state judges are white. And what we see when we look at sentencing outcomes for people is that there are differences not only by race, um, and these are sentencing outcomes controlled uh, by you know, crime and criminal background. So you've controlled for other things. Um, but the sentencing outcomes differ not only by race, but also by shade, so by how dark-skinned someone of a minoritized racial group is. So this brings us to uh, advocacy. So of course, the, the goal, the, the ideal, at least for me, given my bit, is justice, right? That the system is fixed um, so that there's an offer of equal access to both tools and opportunities for people. Um, the reality is uh, some folks don't wanna change the system, some folks do, uh, but we have a system that is not just. And so equality doesn't quite get us to access for everyone. Uh, we have to think about equity, which are custom tools that identify and address uh, inequalities. James Baldwin said, ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Um, and I would posit that as mental health professionals, as people who've had the privilege of attaining the education you have and the societal station you have, uh, that you are someone with a significant amount of power, even though it may not always feel that way. Um, but when it comes to diagnosing people, especially, and the ways that that can follow them uh, in, in different systems, particularly if you're in a community where there is overrepresentation in the criminal justice system, uh, that power is tremendous and something we should all uh, be mindful of um, and, and understand that with that power comes a responsibility to be aware of these structural issues and how they're impacting um, the people that we serve. I had the opportunity to interview Raymond Santana, who is one of uh, what was originally known as the Central Park Five, now known as the Exonerated Five. He went to, uh, or was uh, incarcerated, I should say, not went to, uh, jail at 14, was in, the criminal justice system for seven years uh, before he was exonerated. And then after he was exonerated, the civil suit took an additional 12 years um, after they took away his adolescence and plastered his face across national news. Um, and one of the things that he said was that we need all hands on deck, um, that these issues of 
injustice and of incarceration um, and of the targeting of black and brown men aren't just for politicians or for uh, law enforcement officers or for attorneys uh, to be part of trying to address uh, that we need people from all segments of society um, to be aware of them and to do their part and to lend their voice into trying to address them. So I don't know um, if any of you watch the TV show Secession, um, but it's 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 one that I I enjoy. Uh, it's it's fascinating, really. But for those of you who don't know it, um, the the big premise is that you have this family that is very wealthy. They have a, an aging patriarch, um, and you have these three siblings that are kind of lobbying for a uh, position to be able to take over his role um, in the event that he passes away or is no longer able to, to lead the whole the whole enterprise. Um, and you have some, some different characters in the show. One is uh, Cousin Greg, who is a pretty distant cousin um, and is related to this very powerful like core family, but has some insecurities and is very unsure of himself and uh, kind of is the guy that a lot of people push around and manipulate and use. Um, and he's he's one character. Then you have this uh, character, Roman, who's one of the brothers um, of the patriarch, who's uh, very sarcastic, um, is... Uh, not at all uh, like cousin Greg um, is not going to let anybody uh, push him around um, and will tell you in very colorful language uh, when that that's not okay whenever you try to do so. Um, and Kieran and Culkin plays the role of Roman. That's the, the actor in the middle. But when he was auditioning for the show, he originally auditioned for the cousin Greg role. Um, and he didn't get it because he wasn't a good fit. But as he was reading the Cousin Greg role, he's seeing these lines for this other character named Roman. And Kieran Culkin says, uh, I should be this guy. I should be Roman. And the casting directors were like, you know, we're not even, we're not casting for that, that role yet and just blew him off. But he was so convinced that that role was his role. He recorded himself saying the lines and sent them to the casting director without them asking for it and ended up getting cast in the role and playing it beautifully. Whole point of that story um, is that he was meant to play that particular role. And when he tried to fit into another role, despite the fact that he is an incredibly skilled actor, it did not work. So when we're thinking about social injustice and mental health, it's a really big problem it has a lot of facets to it. There is something that everyone can do. You don't have to play a role that is not um, that is not uh, consistent with you and who you are. So what do you feel uh, deeply inspired by? What are you particularly talented at? And what addresses injustice in your world? Um, and if you can answer those three questions, um, it'll give you a good start in terms of understanding the role that that you can play. You know, it may be that you are a uh, program director, and you make it a point to uh, have representation in your faculty. And maybe you can't get it in your salaried faculty, but one of the things that Arden Dingle, uh, who trained me at Emory did, is she made it a point to um, recruit adjunct faculty who were more representative uh, than what we had on salary at, uh, at Emory at the time. Um, so coming back to what inspires you, what things do you already do, um, and, and leveraging the power that, that you have. And so, you know, talks like these are, are cool. Um, you definitely need the knowledge base, but this is not the work, right? The work is recognizing injustice and your role in sustaining it, responding it, and then iterating and sustaining. And I'll give you some, some examples of how that's, that's looked along, along my journey. In the top right um, corner is Dr. Joe Bona. He was uh, a psychiatrist here in Atlanta and he was the head of our largest sort of safety net mental health uh, system here. And he was a vice chair at Emory for, for a number of years and then went fully into the public sector world. Uh, but he was a tremendous mentor and sponsor to me 
and two other Black women uh, for their career. And Joe is from, you know, upstate New York and a physician's kid. So his background was incredibly uh, different than, than my own. Um, but he mentored across lines and did so really intentionally and, and really quite effectively. Um, and one of the things that we can all fall into is affinity bias, right? Um, naturally gravitating toward people who remind us of ourselves or who uh, we already have these things that we can relate to. So one of the things that you can do if you have a skill set, if you're interested in mentoring or teaching, is being mindful of that affinity bias and being really uh, intentional about overcoming it. Um, in the education piece, right, if you are in a position where you can dictate curricula, rotations, things like that, uh, that you do so in a way that helps your trainees learn about these things. So for instance, um, in our fellowship at Morehouse School of Medicine, their school rotations are chosen to give them an idea of what social inequity looks like in the same city, right? We send them to different places so that they can not just read about different resources, depending on where you are, but see it and see how that translates to uh, the school environment and people's educational progression. Um, in the middle, you have Dr. Anel Prim, who was for many, many years at the American Psychiatric Association, um, and she's a tremendous example of using things like organized medicine um, as routes to develop programs and to mentor and develop people. And then trauma and recovery, um, so a great example of scholarship and literature as a means of advocacy. Uh, before Dr. Herman wrote that book, the, the voice, the experience of people who had survived incest and domestic violence just were not centered in mental health care. Um, and what she did with that book was absolutely a form of advocacy as well. And so I will skip through this a bit since we ended up starting a little bit late, but it's just this idea of critical hope. Um, and one of the things that people ask, you know, after these talks is, you know, it seems so heavy, it seems like so much, um, you know, how do you stay hopeful or, or what's the what's the good news, right? Um, and my response and my orientation is one that uh, is, has been characterized as, as critical hope by a friend of mine in the educational space, in the educational space. And what it means is that the person is involved in a critical analysis of power relations and how they constitute one's emotional ways of, belong, of being in the world while attempting to construct imaginatively and materially a different life world. And there's understood uh, with this definition uh, that sometimes that's going to be hard that sometimes it's going to necessitate uh, difficult conversations um, and that that is a part of um, the work, um, that it's not uh, something that you can do if you're doing well while being avoided of those tough conversations or tough emotions that it's going to bring up. And we're seeing, right, when we think about these mental health bedrocks um, nationally, where decisions are being made uh, that we know are going to impact uh, these bedrocks of mental well-being. Um, so agency, uh, the weakening of voter protections, uh, safety, uh, we've seen the weakening of Miranda, and with autonomy, um, an example is the weakening of reproductive justice. So we will continue to have work to do, right? Uh, but there are also potential actions. So as we think about agency, um, considering ways that we can be part of uh, increasing the vote. Uh, so things like vote ER, um, thinking about ways to raise awareness and understanding about what's happening in the, reproduct in the reproductive uh, space, um, and then helping those we serve who are in over-policed communities understand um, their rights. And knowing um, that progress is always met with retrenchment, um, that it's part of the process, I and mean, that there are ways that uh, progress or those who champion it uh, will be challenged, neutralized, or undermined. And not seeing that as an indicator that something's wrong or that it's not working, um, it actually is an indicator uh, that people see you as see you or see your work um, as something worth coming for uh, because it has the potential to make a change. 
So the question uh, that I'll, I'll ask last, and it's gonna go back to the very beginning of the talk. Uh, so how can every individual realize his or her own potential, work productively and fruitfully, and make a contribution to her or his community um, and for those of you who may not have been at the very beginning or who don't remember, uh, that was our definition of, of mental health. How can people have this in a society that fails to assure equal access to liberties, rights, and opportunities and chooses not to care for its least advantaged members? Um, and that goes back to our definition of justice. Um, and I would posit uh, that the answer is uh, it cannot. Now, I'll leave you uh, with a quote by John Lewis, who was my congressman until the time of his passing uh, here in Atlanta. And he said, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vincent, for that wonderful talk. So much to think about. Um, we are out of time, but I maybe if we wouldn't mind taking a question just to give folks a moment. Um, and if you want to uh, maybe just one or two quickie ones. And again, sorry about the Zoom applause, but <laughs> there's lots of applause out there and appreciation no for your talk. Um, if anyone wants to raise an electronic hand or your real hand, you can, uh, we can maybe have a, a question. Um, let's see who I see out there. I see a chat. Yes, let me look. Right. Um, so um, there's a Philadelphia ACES um, that um, is more expanded that takes into, oh, I'm sorry, the question is about an ACE questionnaire that better accounts for social determinants of, of health. Um, and there's a Philadelphia ACES that, that is expanded and, and does so. And whenever I am in public sector or in um, forensic settings, I try to make it a point to encourage people to use that version if they're going to use that um, scale. One of the other things that I make it a point to try to educate um, folks about is that the way that that test is, or that scale is constructed, because they really latched onto it in, in the justice system. I, and I think it's, in some ways it's good, um, but the way that it's, it's, it's constructed, um, you know, if you have an uncle physically abuse you once, you get one point. If your stepfather sexually molests you from the ages of seven to 12, you get one point. So things that are not going to have comparable effects are given the same kind of weight. And so when you're dealing with people who have faced chronic victimization, it's really not going to, to capture it. Um, so that's important to, to help people uh, understand. There's another one in the chat. You see it there. Um, I don't see the other question. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll read it to you. Do you think that it is possible to attend to the social issues in the current system that values or overvalues the theory of biological bases of all mental illness? In quotes. I think it's possible, right? Um, I think there are ways that we can operate in that system and still keep those things in mind. And I'll give you an example. Um, one of the things that we do a lot of, right, as, as clinicians is educate our patients and their families, right? And, and we get to talk about um, things that are relevant to them and we get to either frame it in a way that is validating and takes these things into account or does not. Um, we had a young black boy in our clinic, um, I think he's 15. He's had police officers pull guns on him. He wasn't armed. Um, he's had his father beat up by police officers father wasn't armed, right? So we talked about him uh, not liking cops, right? I didn't say this is a kid with ODD. <laughs> we talked about his fear and how it was based in his experiences. Now we still did talk to him about knowing his rights and what he could do, but we didn't um, give this child um, labels that we know could, could hurt him or try to medicate his anxiety about cops, right? We validated his experience and tried to give him some tools in terms of navigating, um, you know, what, what is his reality. Um, and so there are always ways uh, that we have agency. And even if the system doesn't give us a DSM diagnosis that we can clearly relate to racial trauma, we can use things like trauma and stress-related disorder NOS, right? We can make sure that our formulation um, captures these aspects. We can make sure that if we use oppositional defiant disorder, that there isn't a better explanation for it, 
and that when it's resolved, we get it out of that kid's chart, right? These are all things that are completely in our power um, to do. All right, I know that our folks have things scheduled now, and I'm sure you do too, Dr. Vincent, and we could also probably talk all day. Um, so thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Sorry about the screw up at the beginning, but we very much appreciate your expertise and your uh, ability to engage our audience. It was a, a wonderful way to spend our Grand Rounds time. Thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>